Welcome to our latest adventure. Today we explore the Warring Triad, the trial series from Heavensward. Kinda crazy Infilia isn't here anymore. Is Elfinaw really in charge now? Why does no one ask if we should be in charge? We're the Warriors of Light. Yeah, this could be our own personal office, headquarters for our many side adventures to come. I could get used to sitting in this fancy chair. Now, go fetch me an adventure. One without Asians, if you would. <laughs> I'm afraid it doesn't work like that. You're coming too. Once upon a time, in Ishgard, Torsa first tells us that we have a guest waiting for us in the Rising Stones. We of course have Tatru send him into our office, but our guest appears to be a lot mm, younger than we were expecting. Where are your parents, kid, and what's with the mask? He introduces himself as Une Kalai and is here to warn us of the rising threat of beings known as icons. He assures us that these icons are not exactly primals, but godlike beings much like the dark divinity Odin. They have been around since the days of the Elegant Empire, and now the Garlean Empire has learned of their power. As the boy talks, Ariange steps in to continue the story. Long ago, the Elegant Empire was able to best the icons in the Battle of Mericidia. After Bahamut fell, three local tribes sought to summon their own protectors and were able to temporarily fend off the Elegant Empire. However, the Elegant Mages devised a means to neutralize the Icon's powers and imprison them. It was after their defeat that Tiamat summoned Primal Bahamut, who was similarly defeated and imprisoned. These three Icons, Sephiroth, Sophia, and Zervan, would become known as the Warring Triad. It would not end there, though, as the Elegans learned to harness the Icon's powers. They refined this knowledge of the icons at the Aetherochemical Research Facility on Azizla. Eras later, when the Archbishop sought out Azizla in an attempt to use the Warring Triad's power, our battle with him and his knights weakened the chains that bound the icons. Should they escape, they will likely destroy everything we hold dear. Una Kalai warns us that entering the containment facility on Azizla will present certain unique challenges. He partnered with some of our fellow scions to prepare for our arrival. He states that our victory hinges upon no less than the total destruction of the Warring Triad. We must be discreet in our journey as well. Should the Garlean Empire catch wind, they'd surely attempt to seize the limitless power for themselves. He says it's his master's desire that the Triad be dispatched before the Imperial forces delve too deeply. As we arrive at the research facility in Azizla, Unakale greets us. He tells us of how the icon Sephiroth's dreaming mind drifts closer to consciousness. Sounds like he'll be our first target. As we head inside, we're joined by Urianje, Kryl, and Ishtola. They tell us of our foe, Sephiroth, the Fiend. Records state that he was once the patron deity of a tribe of tree-like beings in Mericidia. He is said to induce spontaneous growth in living organisms through manipulation of etheric energy. This trait allowed him to grow to gigantic proportions and take on the armies of Alleg. When he was eventually captured by the Alligans, his mind was bound in a dream while his body's energies were harnessed by Alligan technologies. The restraints holding him prevent the release of his aether, regenerating his corporeal form and forcing his body to produce a seemingly limitless supply of power for the research. It is only by releasing his restraints that we can truly banish him. Given the potential brainwashing influence of releasing an icon, only those with the Echo should enter the containment bay. Kryl will enter to unshackle Sephiroth while we jump in to defeat him. Unikalai claims he too cannot be swayed by the Icon's influence and offers to find the control room with Kryl. Suddenly, a nearby node warns us of unauthorized vessels entering restricted airspace. The security systems have engaged the intruders. Orange and Ishtola go to deal with what can only be the Garleans as we enter Containment Bay S1-T7. Disabling Sephiroth's restraints now. Good luck. After defeating the mighty Icon, we head back outside the containment bay. Kryl remarks on how strong we were in defeating such a foe. Kryl said we, Cat, but she really just means me, I'm sure. Unakali ponders on what he could have done if only he had such strength. And thankfully, Ishtola and Urianje's distraction worked as the Garleans were unable to interfere. With one of three icons down, we decide to regroup at the Rising Stones. We take our leave with Kryl. Unseen, Unakali stays back. He senses another's presence. 
It's none other than Regula Van Hydrus, Legatus of the Sixth Legion. He claims to have fallen for our fellow Scion's diversion and makes note to nobulate to the party again. Regula doesn't want to bother with fighting the masked child, so he takes his leave. Realizing the kid is no longer with us, we book it back to where we left Dunicale. He tells us that he mistook a shadow for a man and nothing is amiss. Good. Last thing we want is another shady Orange character around. Kryl asks Sunakale what he hides behind that mask. She detects the desire to test his strength against a certain hero. Her words seem to strike a chord with Sunakale. It's her gift from the Echo that lets her comprehend that which a fellow being would have her know. Sunakale is none too pleased with these discoveries and leaves us to head back to the Rising Stones. As we arrive back in the Rising Stones, we plan for what comes next. When Nikolai states how his master once told him of the elegant technology's potential for calamity, we must be careful in how we proceed. Ustola catches his use of the word, potential for calamity, and asks if that was a direct quote from his master or his own words. When Nikolai says that it was only a figure of speech, nothing more, Kryl senses his wall going back up and asks why he hasn't told us of who his master was. No answers, I guess. So long as we work towards the same goal, I suppose it matters not. For now. As we take some time to prepare to head back to Oz's Law, Ishtola pings the Link Pearl and warns us that the Garleans have breached the research facility. Odd that the Garleans would have a swift means to break past the magic barrier created by our very own Ariange. We arrive at the facility and make our way inside to prevent the Garleans from obtaining elegant secrets, such as the Genesis expression, an aetherochemical formula that allowed scholars of yore to create substance from nothingness. However, Unakale wants to not only safeguard this information, but also take out the head of the Garlean Legion. Quite the ambition there, Unakali. Meanwhile, Ariange is super stumped on how any non-Archon could have disentangled his enchantment. Hmm, how could the Garleans be capable of that? Our pursuit of the Legatus has us pushing through his army of soldiers and mechs, and catching up to him just in time. He draws his sword and engages us, but not even his epic tiger servant can defeat us. He falls before us and the secrets within the nearby Algon Tomlith remain unbreached. With the help from our friends, we surround the Legatus and remind him of the consequences of his actions. His course would have him follow Nail into that of servitude to these icons. Realizing his defeat, Regula pulls a bright light out of his butt, and in his blinding glow, he disappears from sight. Of course. With our foe dealt with, Kryl and Ishtola set up additional seals on the Tomlith. Meanwhile, we head outside with Unakale and Ariange follow shortly after. Ariange outright asks our masked friend why he let the Legatus inside the barrier he created. It's obvious that the Garleans could not get through by any other means. Only someone possessed of an otherworldly gift could have so swiftly removed the barriers. It's clear that Unakale wanted to lure in the Legatus, and use us as the Warriors of Light to defeat him. For you see, not even Kryl knew of the Genesis expression, so surely the Legatus was informed of it and where to acquire the formula, thus setting the bait and location of the trap. Unakale confesses, however, Ariange does not see blame, only caution. Everything worked out this time, but Unakale should really learn to trust his companions more if we're to continue seceding in our efforts. Orange asks that we keep this information secret from Kryl and Ishtola. Wait, didn't we just say to trust our companions? Giving time back to our fellow Scions to repair the barriers, we head to the Rising Stones to prepare for our next Icon encounter. It's here that Unikali opens up to us a bit. He explains how he too has the Echo, though its gift is unlike ours. Regardless, he is dedicated to ensuring the salvation of this star by all means. He claims to know all too well that there is no greater threat to this world than primal harnessing technology. He explains how on another world, a magic was devised that allowed the realm's champions to contain the power of primals within a stone known as Orosite. With each use of the primal's power, the Orosite bled an energy that over time changed the heroes, transforming them into fiends. Their new, insatiable thirst for Aether caused them to turn on the living, and they went to war with those that they used to protect. The result was a world wiped of life. Unakale was sent by his master to ensure the same fate does not befall our world. Back to the task at hand, Yastrola detected erratic etheric waveforms from the sector containing the icon Sophia, the goddess. Sophia is fixated on the idea of equilibrium, and her worshippers saw the rigging of the scales as their sacred duty. 
Ironically, summoning an icon only upsets their precious balance even more. With Sophia close to waking, we make haste for the research facility, but on arrival, hear that we have yet another intruder. This time, it's a dark-figured paladin with glowing yellow eyes and armor. He is joined by a dragoon and a white mage. He calls us a bunch of alligans, recites some poetry about his goddess, and teleports off. Based on their dialect and appearance, it's safe to assume that they were Mericidians that became enthralled to the goddess Sophia. If the tomes read true, they will definitely have a hand in our fight against Sophia. I leave the goddess in your capable hands. Just watch out for her worshippers. After defeating Sophia, we regroup the team. A question still remains, how did the thralls of Sophia awaken so quickly? Perhaps one of the Garlean soldiers got too close to her sector when they infiltrated the containment facility earlier. Sophia could have claimed the soldier's will and released her thralls without even gaining consciousness yet. Another question is how the thralls knew so much about the facility's containment systems. Our best answer is found in an observation Cryle made. She noticed a subtle flaw in one of the mechanisms which held the goddess in check. This flaw was clearly added intentionally. Bunukale tells us of a story that gives meaning to the discovery. Apparently, towards the end of the Third Astral Era, when the Mericidians faced extinction at the hands of the Allegan Empire, Sophia devised a plan of counterattack. She had her followers conspire with a rebel faction within the Allegan Empire who agreed to tamper with the prison intended for Sophia. That way, when she was captured, there would exist a means to escape. As it would turn out, the rebels were found out and executed, which is why the flaw remained hidden, never triggered until today. Should the rebels have been successful, we may have seen the prophecy Sophia's followers recite. She would have unleashed Bahamut on the Allegans from within to set right the scales of justice. Kind of a crazy plan. The two icons would probably have destroyed everyone, not just the Allegans. With one remaining icon left, we head back to the Rising Stones to plan our next fight. As per usual, when we leave with the Scions, Unicolai hangs back. This time he interacts with a verification node and deactivates a stasis chamber's support system. All subjects have been terminated. Back at the Rising Stone, Yashola comes in to scold Unicolai. She accuses him of killing all the remaining thralls of Sophia by cutting off their life support. He admits he acted based on the information he had. The Allegans were using them to sustain the icons in a similar way to that of Bahamut's kin when they captured the Great Worm in Dalamud. Each of these icons' prisons could spawn something equal to that of the Seventh Umbral Calamity if things got out of hand. He killed them so that we, the Warriors of Light, wouldn't have to do such a distasteful task. Ishtola tells him off about his presumptions of us and what we are willing to do or not do. Honestly, kid, we don't mind doing the dirty work. If you wanted to help us out, you'd cover for the nonsense chores they have us do sometimes. Our last icon is Zervin, the demon. According to records, he was worshipped by the Mercidian tribesmen. We make our way to the containment facility in search of this final powerful foe. However, on arrival, we find none other than Regula Van Hydrus. He claims that the followers of Zervin have awakened and are attempting to awaken their icon. He says that there is no information of substantial value to the Emperor here, and now that Zervin stirs, his men are putting their lives on the line to stop him. Given that they do not possess the Echo, he suggests we hurry to help his comrades defeat the Thralls before Zervin breaks free. It seems as though the enemy of my enemy is my friend today. In an unlikely team-up, we join the Garleans into Zervin's containment bay, and as expected, the Garlean soldiers have turned on each other, influenced by the sleeping Zervin's aura. The four towers around the arena must be destroyed to stop this madness. Kryl, Unicale, and ourselves can each take one with the protection of the Echo. Regula offers to destroy the last tower, even at the threat of being manipulated himself. When we run out to destroy the towers, the thralls of Zervin knock Unicale to the ground and prepare to swing at him again. Seeing this, Regula leaps over to intercept the thrall and save Unicale. While we destroy the final towers, Zervin breaks free of his restraints and has enough energy to strike at Regula. Zervin's weapon pierces Regula's really epic gun blade, shattering it and dealing a lethal blow to the Legatus. Zervin falls back into his state of unconsciousness, now that the towers are no longer feeding him aether. Unicolai rushes to Regula's side. 
He asks why he would save him like that. Regula tells him that the boy's gift of the Akko is too precious to waste. For one day, the Emperor may be in need of it in the war upon the untamable icons. The Legatus is happy to lay down his life in service of Emperor Varus. His last wish is that we lay low the beast that would end his life. With that, he succumbs to his wound. There's been enough sacrifice for one day. We must take the chance we've been given and defeat Zerban now. With the final beast of the Warring Triad defeated, we rejoin our friends. During the fight, the surviving Garleans had left with the Fallen. Everyone was brave today, but Unakale has his doubts about his own performance. When asked about why he continually holds himself to the arbitrary status of a hero such as ourselves, he simply asks that we rejoin him in the Rising Stones if we wish to hear about it. Taking the hint, we regroup with the Scions back at our home base. It is there that Unakale shows his true face. Pun intended. Beneath the mask is a boy not of this world, a child born of a different star who was unable to stop the impending doom that swallowed his world. Though gifted with the Echo, he had not matured enough to become a true warrior of light, a hero by any measure. The world that was destroyed is what we here know as the Void. The story of the heroes turned to fiends from the bleeding orosite containing primals was truly of people becoming void sent. An Asian robed in white saved him and brought him to the rift between worlds. Elidibus has been his master ever since. It was here that Elidibus told Unakale about the other worlds and the fragile balance between light and dark. Too strong a shift in either would cause a calamity and ripple its dangerous effects across the other worlds. Elidibus asked Unakale to go to the Source, our world, and help prevent a similar fate from befalling it. And although Unakale doesn't feel like a hero compared to us, who already clearly has everything under control, Ariange praises his great deeds thus far. For you don't need to be a hero to do great deeds, but rather it is in doing great deeds that makes you a hero. And by some ridiculous judgment, Yastola thinks that's good enough grounds to invite Unakalai into the science. I hope he truly is a hero, the little Asian mentee. Come on, help me spruce up our new office. Hmm, what's this painting about? Where'd you get it? I can't quite remember. I know I got it from somewhere during our adventures. Well, this could be referencing the Four Lords, an ancient fairy tale from the Far East. I'm guessing you don't remember anything else about the adventure either? Eh. <sighs> Sounds like a vacation to the Far East is in order. I'll approve our time off request. <laughs> Hurry before Alphino comes back and notices we're gone. Be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe down below. What did you enjoy or not enjoy about the Warring Triad trial series? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.